So the next few slides are review of material that you learned in 189. And the reason why we're going over this is so that it will refresh your memory, especially when we get to chemical digestion of these macromolecules. So speaking of macromolecules, we know that we have four types, which are also referred to as biomolecules. So we have proteins, nucleic acids, in other words, DNA and RNA, carbohydrates, and lipids. And these macromolecules are assembled from small components that we refer to as monomers or subunits or the so-called building blocks. And when we assemble a chain of these monomers, then we have the polymer, these macromolecules. So we have the first macromolecule proteins and their monomer are amino acids. And alanine is one example of the 20 amino acids that we have. And when we link these individual amino acids together, then we form a polypeptide. And the covalent bond that's holding these individual amino acids together are your peptide bonds. So right there is a peptide bond between valine and alanine. So part of chemical digestion of proteins, which will involve proteases, is to break these peptide bonds. So these proteases will literally have to break every single one of these peptide bonds because the only way to absorb protein is when it's literally down to these individual amino acids. Otherwise, it's simply too big. What happens if we end up with three amino acids, right? And three amino acids, two peptide bonds. Then that's referred to as a tripeptide. So then if we only have two amino acids, right, and that means one peptide bond, then we have a dipeptide. So the second macromolecule are the carbohydrates, and the monomers are monosaccharides. And we take individual monosaccharides, link them up together, and through what we call glycosidic linkages, another example of a covalent bond, and so now your carbohydrates will have to break up those covalent bonds between these monosaccharides, these carbohydrates, these enzymes. All right, so when we link individual monosaccharides together, then we have first an oligosaccharide. Speaking of oligosaccharides, oligosaccharides consist of anywhere from 10 to 11 monosaccharides all linked together, giving us an oligosaccharide. Now, if we continue to link up additional monosaccharides, then ultimately we end up with the polymer, for example, starch. So starch is an example of a polysaccharide. All right, now back to the monomers, the monosaccharides. So examples of monosaccharides are glucose, are galactose, fructose, ribose, and deoxyribose. So once again, these are examples of monosaccharides. And the third type of macromolecule are nucleic acids, giving us DNA and RNA. And the monomers, or the building blocks, are nucleotides. So what you're looking at here, folks, is a nucleotide. And so when we link up these nucleotides, then we end up with DNA or RNA. And the covalent bonds that links these individual nucleotides together are what we refer to as phosphodiester bonds. So the main function of nucleases is to break up those phosphodiester bonds so we can end up with these nucleotides. And at that point, the body can absorb those individual nucleotides. Then the last biomolecule are the lipids. There are three major types of lipids. We have triglycerides, we have cholesterol, and we have phospholipids. So this particular example is showing us a triglyceride. So what are the backbone, or what are the monomers, or subunits, or building blocks? Well, we'll look at triglycerides, all right? So the backbone first is this three-carbon chain that we refer to as glycerol, all right? So this is glycerol, and linked together to give us, essentially, a triglyceride. So Fa means fatty acid, right? So Fa means fatty acid. So we are going to have three fatty acids giving us a triglyceride, right? So this again is a triglyceride. And the reason why I'm saying this is because what lipases will do, enzymes that will chemically digest this triglyceride, is to literally break these 
bonds. And the type of covalent bonds that links the fatty acid to the glycerol backbone are ester linkages. So that's what the lipases have to do. They have to break those ester linkages in order to absorb this triglyceride um, or in order to absorb the lipids from our diet. All right, and so if we, let's say, take away one fatty acid, all right, so this is cut. That means a lipase has broken off one of the fatty acids. So therefore, we are now down to a diglyceride. And if we break off another fatty acid, in other words, this is what's left, then we have a monoglyceride. So once again, the lipases are what's going to break those ester linkages. And this is how we're going to absorb the fat that's coming from our diet. So let's now talk about enzymes, pathways, and substrates. So almost all metabolic reactions, both catabolic and anabolic, involve a series of steps that's referred to as a pathway. So what we're looking at here is a simple pathway that I've illustrated. And at each given step of this pathway, there is almost always a specific enzyme involved. Now note, if any of these enzymes are missing at any step of the pathway, then the process immediately stops and we can never form the final product. So if we start off with reactant A, in order to get to B, then we need that input of enzyme A. To get from B to C, then we need enzyme B. And then so on and so forth until we get to the final product. Now what are enzymes? So enzymes almost all are proteins. The reason why is because they found that some RNA actually has enzymatic activity. Now the specific chemical or the specific substance or molecule that the enzyme interact with is referred to as the enzyme substrate. And often, but not always, the enzymes are named after their substrate, and they end with the ASE. So lipid is the substrate for the enzyme lipase. Lactose is the substrate for the enzyme lactase. So one good example of this exception is pepsin. So pepsin is an enzyme, and it does not end in ASE, and its substrates are proteins. So the enzyme binds to its specific substrate at the enzyme's active site. So it's like a little pocket that's meant to accommodate this specific substrate. And it's based on the lock and key. Now, it's not the lock and key that you imagine, like the key that fits into your door, for example. What it follows is what's referred to as the induce fit model. So it's as if, let's say, you are getting ready to shake someone's hand, all right? So the shape of your hand fits nicely with the other person's hand that you're about to shake. So here you are. You're getting ready to now shake hands, all right? Now, following this induced fit model, in order to make sure you have a nice, good grip, you tighten your grip. So your hand slightly changes in shape, all right? So that's the induced fit model. So when the substrate fits into that active site, it, the enzyme will sort of hug that substrate, and that's called the induced fit model. Now, enzymes allow reactions to occur that would otherwise not occur at normal body temperature and normal body conditions. So enzymes function at its best, that's what's referred to as the optimum temperature and the optimum pH. So what we're looking at the bottom here are two illustrations of enzyme substrate, all right? So we have the enzyme plus the substrate, which will give us an enzyme substrate complex, and then ultimately we have the enzyme plus the product. Now, one of the unique characteristics of enzymes that we don't often find in other substances is that the enzyme before the reaction is the same enzyme after the reaction. So over here, we have this enzyme at the beginning and the enzyme at the end. So this enzyme has not changed. This is unique, folks, to enzymes. The fact that the structure of that enzyme does not change allows it to basically go back and interact with another substrate. So here is this enzyme, and here is this pocket, that active site. So the shape of that substrate fits nicely into that active site of that enzyme. Therefore, we can say that this is the substrate of this specific enzyme. Over here, we have another example. This time, we have two substrates, all right? And here is this enzyme, once again, the active site. So that little pocket is meant to accommodate the shape of its substrate, and then it fits into here following the lock and key, but it follows the induced fit model, so the enzyme hugs that substrate even better, 
and therefore we can now then have an enzyme substrate complex and then ultimately form the product. Okay, so the first thing we're looking at over here is your decomposition, all right? This is essentially catabolism, and catabolism is the decomposition or de degradation, in this particular case, of subs one substrate, which will yield us two products. And folks, this is what we see with chemical digestion. This is what those pancreatic enzymes and those brush border enzymes will do. It'll take a larger substrate and catabolize it to where we now have smaller products. All right, and then this over here is your anabolic reaction. So with anabolism, we see synthesis. So we have these two smaller substrates and of course the specific enzyme that has the active sites that will accommodate the substrate. So what are we doing? We're building something bigger. All right, so this is a good example of an anabolic reaction. So what we'll now do is give an example or illustrate a catabolic reaction and we'll use polysaccharides as our example. So polysaccharides and one of which are starches. So a good example of a polysaccharide is starch. Now is it the only type of polysaccharide? Absolutely not. We have glycogen for example or cellulose or other examples of polysaccharides but we're going to use this as our example. Well we have two types of starch. We have amylose and amylopectin. All right, so these are the two types of starch. And starch is a polysaccharide composed of many, 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 many monosaccharides of glucose. All right, so glucose are the building blocks of starch, amylose and amylopectin. The enzyme that breaks down these starch molecules is amylase. All right, and amylase is produced by the salivary glands and by the pancreas as part of that digestive enzymes, the pancreatic enzymes, which ultimately becomes part of that pancreatic juice. So amylase is produced in the salivary glands, so we'll put salivary amylase, and produced by the pancreas. We're going to call it pancreatic amylase. All right, so the two sources of this amylase. So what exactly is amylase going to do? to this starch molecule. Well, it's going to hydrolyze it. It's going to break this thing down. All right, so what then happens to the starch once amylase has had a chance to work on that starch? So that happens in our mouth, and that happens in the small intestines. So ultimately, this now becomes oligosaccharides. All right, so oligosaccharides plus maltose. All right, now. Oligosaccharides, as I mentioned before, is composed anywhere from 10 to 11 monosaccharides, all linked up through glycosidic linkages. Now, what about maltose? Maltose is an example of disaccharides. So let's go ahead and list the disaccharides that I would like you to know. So disaccharides are composed of two monosaccharides. So we'll put disaccharides. So we'll begin with maltose. So maltose is composed of glucose linked to glucose. Now, the enzyme that will break down maltose, this disaccharide, is the enzyme maltase. So maltase is the enzyme, all right? And another disaccharide is lactose, the so-called milk sugar. All right, and that's composed of the monosaccharides glucose linked to galactose. And the enzyme that will break this lactose molecule down, this disaccharide, is the enzyme lactase. Right? So someone who is lactose intolerant, they do not produce lactase and that makes their GI uh, wreak havoc. So their GI is like, I don't know what to do with this lactose, so they have a lot of gas, they have a diarrhea, for example, because they're unable to chemically break down lactose because they're not producing lactase. And I'll talk about what exactly is producing these enzymes in just a second. All right, then we have sucrose. 
This is your table sugar, and that's composed of two monosaccharides, glucose and fructose, right? And fructose, sometimes is referred to as your fruit sugar. So a lot of our fruits have a high concentration of fructose. Anyway, the enzyme that breaks this is sucrase. All right, now, as I mentioned before, the final cut, all right, the final uh, breaking of larger molecules into their individual monosaccharides in this particular case happens because of the brush border cells, all right? So those brush border enzymes will chemically do the final cut. So this is what we're seeing right here. So once again, the brush border enzymes will cut the two individual glucoses, will cut maltose, will hydrolyze lactose, and will hydrolyze sucrose. And I'll put brush border enzymes. And we already know where they're located. So at this point, now that we've broken these disaccharides into their individual monosaccharides, we can now absorb these molecules.